Welcome to 321 I Relaunch, the podcast where we discuss return to work strategies, advice, and success stories. I'm Carol Fishman Cohen, CEO and co founder of I Relaunch, and your host. Today, we welcome Marion Vare. Marion is program manager for the Technology Leadership Development Program within the Star Career Development Center at Baruch College. Marion moderated our successful relaunchers panel at the October 2021 iRelaunch Return to Work Conference. Marion stepped away from full time employment to focus on childcare. And in the years since, he's held a variety of freelance, adjunct, and part-time positions in higher education, many of which focus on career counseling. In this episode, Marian will tell us about his experience relaunching, as well as his expertise in higher education and career counseling. Marian, welcome to 321 iRelaunch. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here, and I hope my story can inspire and motivate people who are listening to the podcast. I'm sure it will. And I'm excited to have the conversation. And I'd like to begin uh, by asking you a little bit about your background and what you did prior to your career break, and then what prompted you to take your career break. Okay, great. Well, I started my career after graduate school in academic advising. And sort of after that, quickly got into career counseling and really, really gravitated and really enjoyed that piece of it. So I've gotten a chance to work at different career centers around the city. And I got a chance to work in human resources, doing IT recruiting. I also got a chance to be a diversity manager um, uh, in a corporation. So it really was um, the goal really for a lot of the themes of my role was really just to help people transition into the world of work and sort of find meaningful work wherever, if that's on the education side or in the corporate side. And prior to leaving, um, you know, full-time work, um, prior to that, I, you know, after adopting my first daughter, uh, deciding to be the primary caretaker. Um, it was just something that I, you know, we had, when you're adopting a, a child, it's always never your choice. Sometimes it's mostly a lot by luck and matching. And mm-hmm. so when I decided to transition into being the primary caretaker, I sort of decided to give up th- that world. And I really enjoyed my work at the time. I was a diversity manager and really loved enjo- that type of work. Um, and then decided to do a, be a primary take- caretaker and really Work did it for about a year and a half until I found my current role here at Brew College. Wow. So that's a lot. Um, let me just break that down a little bit. First of all, just to clarify for people who don't know, Baruch College is in New York City. So references to the city are New York City. Uh, and you're talking, Marian, about uh, adoption and how the uh, adoption process is also very unpredictable in terms of timing. And then you ultimately made the decision to be the lead parent, as Anne-Marie Slaughter puts it, or the primary caregiver. Um, So you step away from the workforce, um, you're in that role for a year and a half, and then when did you decide it was time to take on some sort of um, freelance or adjunct, or how did you even decide that it was gonna be a non-traditional kind of position? And what were your first steps in uh, recognizing you wanted to do it and then uh, actually getting your first position? Uh, I think for so long, my work was partly my identity. You know, being a parent wasn't an option at the time. And when it became um, an option in a very short, very quick period of time, um, and I just kind of gravitated to being a full-time parent, um, I would say about a year I started, you know, part of sort of assessing my situation and like my own identity. because. The first year you're kind of being the parent and that becomes your identity and everything else kind of changes Mm -hmm. around that. And so after I would say about a year, I began to feel like something in my life, like what what does it look like after this kid becomes going to school and so forth for the future? So I really I think I would say given a whole year, I signed it's like, you know, what what else is there? Okay, great. I'm doing all these parenting stuff, going to the playground, doing the play dates and so forth. And that's great for the kid. Like then I have to kind of think about myself, like what's right. for me, you know, what's in this whole parenting for me besides, you know, having, a, being a, having a child and being a, a parent role. So I sort of start just asking around, looking to see what's out there. It wasn't really looking at job boards. I was just talking to sort of people in my network, started sort of having lunch meetings more for friends at first. Um, and then became to transition to like professional friends and so forth. So first my friends just to, get back into it and, you know, not really dressing up and sort of just dressing how you dress when you're at home. 
Um, and my friends could do that. And as I sort of felt more comfortable being out with a kid, with my first kid, because I would take my child with me. It wasn't something I would like, I didn't have a babysitter at the time. So I would just take my my little girl with me at the time. And so having friends, I felt like they were more comfortable if I can't have a, a continuous conversation. <laughs> right. um, and so I think as I become more comfortable, so I started talking to more professional contacts. And through that, um, an opportunity at Baruch just kind of organically happened. It wasn't even an application that happened. It was just a conversation that said, you know, if anyone hears of anything, let me know. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of entertaining a part-time role, definitely not a full-time thing. I really want to find a balance of being at home and also, and you know, appeasing my sort of professional side of my identity. And so um, in Baruch, my, my director now, um, you know, outreach to me says we have this part-time opportunity. You can give it a try, try it out for a few months, see if it works, you know, from both sides. And I've been here for over 10 years. So wow. kind of, uh, kind of worked out and it, I really find that it, it's a really good balance in being at home and doing all the PTAs on the ch children's homework and all that stuff. And still also being able to do some work that helped my professional side. Mm -hmm. my professional identity. Wow. All right. So, so let, again, let, let you said so much there. I, I, I sort of want to break it into um, some subtopics. So first of all, you said um, you started out by just meeting with friends. And I love this idea that you were easing yourself into the process. You said you could dress casually. You're bringing your daughter. You, and you might not have a continuous conversation because she might need attention. And it was kind of this way of getting you into this mode of, of going out to have these conversations. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, so that's happening. And then you said you moved to more professional contacts. So at that point, did you still take your daughter with you or did you get a babysitter? I did. You did? Okay. I did. I, I did. Yeah. It was more like, you know, like they're not like cold connections. It was people I've known in my professional world. And yeah. so, you know, I didn't, I wouldn't talk to them like my friends on a regular basis or see, they were like people I would know through work or through my network. But I would, I would end up taking my my daughter with me, mm -hmm. um, and you know, strategically planning it so it's during nap times and so right. forth. <laughs> and uh, but I didn't, uh, yeah, I was kind of like, you know, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna bring the kid. This is why I stay home and focus on having the kid. And it's, you know, I I think knowing now that my interaction with my friends that it w went okay, mm -hmm. you know, the, my my daughter wasn't having a tantrum and a fit in front of everyone. I felt more comfortable to transition into that sort of uh, more professional um, lunches and meetings. Okay. So I want to ask you some specific questions there. So when you're transitioning into these more professional, so these are friends of yours from work, work friends. Correct. Um, Correct. And so d when you reached out to them, um, did you... Like, what did you actually say? That just, hey, it'd be really fun to have lunch together. Or did you say, I'm trying to figure out or I'm starting to figure out how I want to re-enter the work world? Like, how, what did you actually say to them? Sure. I think I, I was more subtle about it. I definitely was, you know, it's been a while, long time, no here. It'd be great to catch up, mm -hmm. talk to you. you know, I wanted to say, this is what I'm doing now. I'm kind of, you know, playing the, I'm a dad, full-time dad now. Um, but I, you know, it'd be great to catch up and talk about how life is, depending where they work and where I worked with them. Um, and I think it was more like feeling the water. Then I didn't want to feel like just go in there and be like, I want to, I want you to help me with finding something. So I yeah. felt like if I, if I did that conversation, like, hey, you know, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do. I didn't want that burden on them in the first meeting, especially if I hadn't worked with them for maybe a few years. Maybe the more recent one that would be that would be easier. Like I know my my previous boss before it turned it to full time. That was easier because they threw me a baby shower at work wow. and you know they know I left. So it's easier to say, oh, it'd be great. You want you can see Olivia again and so forth. Um but with the ones who I haven't seen in a while, it was a little more subtle. I think it was yeah. too much to say, I'm looking for your work or I'm thinking about thinking about going, I want you to sort of even if that's sort of even though I'm not really meaning it in that way, it might be perceived that way. And I knew that it was important to just like let's just meet up and catch up and go from there. All right. I hope everyone is listening really carefully to this. It's such an important point that you don't want to, uh, when you're reestablishing relationships, especially if you haven't been in touch with someone uh, for an extended period, you don't want to go in there in an uh, opportunistically, like how can you help me get a job kind of thing. You want to rebuild your relationship with them and really connect with them on a human level and have a conversation 
And that's the first conversation. It could be, well, maybe work doesn't even actually really come up that formally, or maybe it does because there's something natural in the conversation that leads there, but that's not where, where you, what you start with. So, so glad you are making this point. I think it's super, super important. Um, so when you had those conversations, did, were they just kind of fun, like let's reconnect and uh, kind of conversations and then subsequent conversations led to, or you just said, did you end the conversation by saying, were they saying, what are you thinking about now? And then I'll, I'll keep my eye out for you. Or how did that happen? Or what was the timing Absolutely. of that? Absolutely. I, it definitely organically sort of transitioned into that. It's like, well, what are you doing now? So, you know, we, we would get the whole, oh, my gosh, the baby's cute. Yeah. You know, how old's the baby now? What is yeah. all that stuff that you would do when you when there's a new baby in the, in the room? Yeah. I think once you got that, it's like, oh, what are you doing now? You know, that conversation is like, what do you do besides the whole, are you thinking about other things? So I think it organically happened that way. And there were parts that I was like, oh, yeah, no, absolutely. That'd be something that I can do or if anything comes up. Um, you know, there were definitely that organic conversation where it transited, like, what are you doing now? Or are you doing this for a while? Are you doing this forever? Um, so definitely transition to a professional so conversation after, you know, the formalities of talking about the baby and everything mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. And I, 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 I thought that was important. So, it, I mean, again, it also depends on the person that I was with, because most of them were, you know, people I connected with at work. And that's why I think I've stayed in contact with them for a certain number of years. Mm -hmm. um, so it was easy to, uh, but I felt like for me, um, I never liked to ask. I always never, I feel uncomfortable sometimes, but I, I try to steer the conversation that way so that it sort of becomes a lot more natural rather than this is what I need from you. Yeah. Um, and I felt right. like that for me has worked a lot more than asking someone to do something for me. It's really, really a great approach and, and great advice for people. So you said it didn't even take that long. You're having a number of these conversations and then you ended up having the conversation that led to the opportunity 10 years ago of where you are now. What exactly was that opportunity and how was it described to you and what happened? Like, how did it even turn into a job? Sure. I, I would say it's even started before I decided to transition into full-time work. So when I was working in this corporation, I wanted, you know, I always enjoyed working in higher education. And so even though I'm working in the corporate side, I try to spend some part of my work working some with the college student population. So I did some workshops at Brew College. I worked, did workshop other places I've worked at, you know, the students that I've worked with there. And I remember that the person who replaced me in my role when I decided to transition into a full-time parent, she I invited her to come to Baruch and speak and so that there's that natural transition. Like she's taken over. So if you have any questions after today, mm -hmm. talk to her, not me, because I'm gonna be a parent now, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I, you know, I think with having that conversation with my current boss now, you know, saying like, yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely working, doing the full-time parenting thing, but I'm open to to talking about part-time work, whatever part-time. I don't know what that part-time means. Like, you know, does that mean three days a week, two days a week, one day a week? I didn't really have that idea in my mind, but I was willing to do some form of part-time work, mm -hmm. um, whatever that may be. And then um, my boss emailed me saying, I know you're doing the, I remember her email saying, I know you're doing the full-time thing. I don't want to get into the way of, you know, you being a parent. But this came, we had budget for it. And so here's what you would end up doing and which is working the career services office. And I became like sort of a, a go-to person for whatever they need to fill in. Mm -hmm. So if someone needs to do career, more career counseling stuff, I would do career counseling. Mm -hmm. They needed someone who can do workshops, I did the workshop. So I think because I've worked for so long in career services, I, I could basically fill in wherever they needed me for within the, within the department. And so... Um, it was perfect because I was able to just not do one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was great that I was able to sort of hit the ground running. And I've, I've known her for so long because I, I did my graduate internship at Baruch College tw 21 years ago now. Um, and so she was one of my supervisors at the time. Oh, wow. And so we, I, in, it's a, career services is a small world. So you run into each other in conferences and so forth. I remember my old director, I, I presented at a national conference at Disneyland for a conference there. And I remember my, my boss now had attended my presentation there like know, 15 years ago or something like that. 
So it's a small world and, you know, we've stayed in touch. And I think this is the beauty, like I'm sure people have heard the word networking. Um, it wasn't like a forced network. It's these are people I enjoyed working with. I, these are people I've enjoyed sort of knowing and I've sort of stayed in touch with them throughout the years organically mm-hmm. um, without the thought of like, I'm going to use this person 20 <laughs> years from now for this purpose. Right. Um, it was just good to know these people. And, right. you know, and it was, and it was like sort of natural. If I think I, in the beginning, I've always like hard time with networking because I do find myself more of an introvert than an extrovert, but I felt like it was important for my career. So I started to nurture it slowly by slowly. And I feel more comfortable with it now. I'm glad you're talking about the, how you handle these kind of interactions and and outreach as an introvert, because I think um, many of us in the audience consider ourselves introvert and, and, and it's hard to do that networking step. And that networking step is the one that is usually the key factor leading to the job opportunity. Absolutely. Um, All right. So can you talk a little bit about how your role evolved over time and what was like at what, different moments in time did things change and how did they change? Sure. So I started more as a fill-in with different things within the office, within the career services office. And then as they needed more things, I, I sort of helped with training our peers, students. These are students that would see other students for basic resume, LinkedIn, things like that, sort of those edits. And then transition into doing alumni career counseling. So I'd focused a lot for a few years, alumni programming, doing a lot of the workshops, um, and I guess this is sort of how we got together with the iRelaunch and working with that panel. So, and then I, I just, you know, we're, we're, I, there was a growing population of CIS students, students who are interested in technology at Baruch. It's definitely increased dramatically throughout the years. And we have other leadership programs, but we didn't have one that was focused in technology. And I really always appreciated this group. And so when it was time to like come up with a new program, like my director had asked, like, if anyone has any great ideas, let us know. And then I authored this proposal to work on this leadership program. Um, and I authored it, got approved, it got funded. And so I became the program manager for it. And wow. this is the second year we've run it. And it's been hugely successful, better than I expected. Um, but always the, the theme has always been helping students enter the workforce in some capacity, whether that's through internship part-time job or full-time work. So you're working with both current students and also alumni. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Alumni in different capacity. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, working for a city university, it's not a private university. Funding is not always readily available. So we kind of, you become like a jack of all trades. You end up doing wherever you're needed. Mm-hmm. But the technology leadership program is for alumni. Uh, it's for undergraduates. Students, oh, it's for not current for, students. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, current students. The alumni, I would say they work in that they help with mentoring. They do workshops. They come back. and So it's their way to give back. I see. Um, but the program is specifically for undergraduate current students. Okay. Got it. Um, so obviously you started your career in higher education and career, career counseling, and then you came back to the same field. So does that mean you just determined for, for yourself that you were in the right field to begin with and you wanted to come back to exactly what you left? Absolutely. Um, I started, you know, I'm a first generation immigrant and I really didn't have people that in my world that was helping me with my career in, earlier on in my career. So I never really used career services in undergraduate and in graduate school, you know, they push, it's more of a career focus. So you're once you're only there for a couple of years versus um, grad, uh, undergraduate, you're there for four plus years in a way. And so when I did, I, you know, I, I kind of wanted to initially in my career, I wanted to be a marriage family therapist. And that was what, like what I was gunning for. And that's really what I was focusing on was doing my license. I was going to go back to California where I grew up, where I'll, you know, for my licensure to be a marriage family therapist. Mm-hmm. And then um, I did this graduate internship at Baruch. And it was a rotationary program at the time where one semester I worked in the counseling center. And one semester, another semester, I would work in the career services office. And I've never really thought of career counseling. I never heard of it. I didn't know what it was. And when I did the internship, I really, it really spoke to me. It really felt natural. I knew I've always wanted to help people, and I just didn't know how to do that in the beginning of my career. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew that that was like a big theme. That the type of work I was going to do was going to help people to some way. And 
when I did the career counseling internship and really talked to students about their career, it really felt natural. I really, it really sort of um, resonated with my that type of work. And so after my first job was an academic advisor uh, in the school of computer science and information system, um, I re- and then I transitioned to be a career counselor. It really just felt natural mm-hmm. um, to really help people, you know, sort of with the world of work. And even when I transitioned to be like a recruiter, it was always still the, uh, similar in the, in the other side, basically. I would still do workshops at universities as a profession, as a recruiter. I would bring in students to come on the work, you know, the, the job site to explore the opportunities there. So it was always like the same concept. It's just, it was more focused on placement than process. You know, as a career counselor, you're processing people's interests, career interests, where in when you're working in an HR role, it's more about like, this is the job we're trying to place you in. Right. And I'm wondering if your own experience as a relauncher has impacted the way that you approach your career counseling or speak with certain alumni, maybe who have non-traditional career paths. Has has any has that changed at all the way you you um, counsel people? Absolutely, I, absolutely, without a doubt. I think our experiences shape us in our interactions with people. I think I was a lot more understanding. I, I would say in the beginning, I would say you know like what's so hard about parenting when I didn't have a kid? You know, it's always like, <laughs> and when I had a kid, I realized like it's very consuming, mm-hmm. you know, and definitely very appreciative of people who can manage to work full time and still have a family. Um, so when I work with more seasoned people and then they talk about having to leave for certain purposes, whether that's to care for someone, um, you know, being a primary caretaker, whatever it may be, I definitely was much more sensitive and understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, and definitely at the time, you know, early, when I wasn't aware about relaunch many years ago. So once I was aware about this program and all these companies are really going on board to help people you know, who sort of left the workforce for a number of years, I realized there are clearly a lot of employers who are appreciative of people who have to take that break for whatever, whatever reason it may be. Um, And I would tell you that in my my earlier, my career, I was kind of like, employers are not going to buy into that. Mm. Um, But now that I've experienced it for myself um, and having worked with different employers, I can say that, you know, I've definitely changed in that I'm a lot more sensitive, a lot more open and understanding to that. And I think, employers are also understanding that there's really good talent out there who just made a ch- personal choice or whatever that choice may be. And they decide to go back and it's not about having a big gap on their resume. And that's, you know, it's always been for a while, that's always been frowned upon. And I think if you can explain why you're doing that, why you did what you did, where their gap is, employers are really a lot more understanding about that gap. Yeah. uh, And there's really been an evolution and I'm sure you've seen it, you know, over the last 10 years that uh, the idea that people take career breaks for reasons that have nothing to do with their work performance. It's an external factor and that doesn't impact their ability to be high performers again. And more employers are recognizing this. And we relaunchers were a hidden talent pool. We still are to some degree, but to less of a degree than before. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for relaunchers who are interested in relaunching in higher education, uh, whether they started in that field or whether they're um, uh, coming to this field as a career transition. Absolutely. And higher ed is a huge industry. So it's not just about being a teacher or being an administrator, I think that's the natural thing that people might think of as oppor- the only opportunities available in higher education. But really, it's pretty much every position you could think of from every universities. So I think that because people who work, who tend to work in higher education, are really people who are invested in helping people, mm-hmm. it's really an easy way to network with people in that field. So you know, most people are now in LinkedIn. So network with people and really outreach to people and say, I'd love to set a time to talk to you about how you got to where you are today. Mm -hmm. And higher education, I think, are totally open to that. I've not heard anyone ever or met anyone that would not be open to having a conversation about how their their career started in higher education. Um, Join conferences. I think, you know, uh, people still love to go to conferences. You know, eventually, once we can all be more in person, I think, and then virtual conferences, I think, 
those are really wonderful way to explore um, opportunities in higher education. Uh, networking with professionals, definitely attending those professional conferences because a lot of times people network in those places for opportunities that they might have. Um, and then lastly, like join groups. There's so many groups now. I mean, now with technology, there's so many groups that you can join and people share things in there. Uh, you're very useful, especially if you want to, if you're li living in one state and you're looking to move to a different state, that's, those groups are fantastic for that because um, a lot of them are nowadays are totally open to speaking virtually. Mm -hmm. You know, I love how you point out that there's so many more opportunities to work in a college or university environment that are outside of the faculty and, and, and the teaching part of it. There's a website called Higher Education Recruitment Consortium, hercjobs.org, which is either the largest or one of the largest websites with opportunities in higher education. And I know that they divide those opportunities into faculty and teaching roles and administrative and, and non-teaching roles. So if you think Correct. about everything that is involved in making a university run, it does, run, it does cover the whole gamut of all different functions. Absolutely. It's, it's a huge opportunity. And I, I would say that until I started really working there, I always thought it was always administrators, faculty, and that was it. Mm -hmm. But now it's everything from accounting to finance to HR to the typical things that you would think of in higher education. Right. We have lawyers who are working in the legal department, um, facilities management, uh, so uh, landscaping, you know, so, so many um, different types of roles that are opportunities in higher education. Marian, can you talk about any resources that might be available for Baruch alumni who are relaunchers and also for our relaunchers who are not affiliated with Baruch? For as a Baruch alum, you have tons of free resources, not only because you're part of Baruch College, but you're part of the city university system. And so you have resources available to you, Baruch College. So as an under, if you did your undergraduate alumni work, at Baruch, you would use the Star Career Development Center. If you did your graduate work, we have Graduate Career Services Office, and the Graduate Career Services Office are all free. Tons of resources on meeting with a career counselor, workshops. Uh, they even have their job databases, so that's another resource. Um, job database, you know, most job databases within career services are really focused on students, but they also have tons of opportunities for alumni. Not as much compared to current students, but still plenty. And so I would say, like, take advantage of those resources at Baruch College. They also have um, the Baruch Alumni Association, where they meet on a regular basis to just to network. And these are people coming from different industries, meeting at a local place. And it's a great resource to share things like that. Mm. Um, for, for City University, we have CUNY Central. CUNY Central also has sort of like a job database that people can have access to. So it's similar to what you would have at Baruch College, except it's this CUNY Central, where all the CUNY sort of diverge, I guess, in a way. Um, it's a very unique sort of dynamic that most universities then have because it's such a huge network that they have to have the central place for CUNY to be at. Um, and then for people who aren't part of the CUNY system, the city university system, or Baruch, the New York Public Library for people who work or live in New York City and state have tons and free resources. And they actually just upgraded their whole, their whole department. So it's now everything is so is free as long as you get a new york public library card um also the brooklyn public library has tons of workshops where they actually have career counselors they have professional workshops they have people that will edit resumes and do talk about interviewing so those two places are like free great resources for people that work and live in new york city or state wow that's a lot uh and thank you so much for sharing all of them Marion, I want to end by asking you the question that we ask all of our podcast guests, and that is, what is your best piece of advice for our relauncher audience, even if it's something that we've already talked about today? Sure. I always say have a plan. I think with people who, who want to transition to workforce, especially if they're more seasoned, they just kind of want to jump in there and start applying. And I always say have a plan. Have, you know, have an idea of how you're going to go about it. I have a little game plan because otherwise, if what I find from my experience is people will say, I applied for 500 jobs, I'm good to go. But I would say like, you know, 
Has your resume been edited? Mm -hmm. Have you, you know, know where you're going to be looking? Um, have you sort of strategized how you're going to job search every day? Um, have you like talked, if you haven't interviewed in a while, have you practiced your interview skills? So I would say people, you know, don't jump right into it. Know if everything is ready and good to go first. Bef and then how are you going to plan to do that rather than it's just, I know everyone sometimes need a job and they just want to do it right away. But I find that's less helpful than having an idea on how you're going to go about your job search. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's sort of like the idea is quality over quantity. You know, in addition to like planning about jobs, job searching, are you going to be networking? Is that what's your job search strategy um, about transitioning from, you know, having uh, not working at all to working full time, how to sort of transition from that. Because I think that's the, that Mike's from working with people, that's the number one thing I see people sometimes do is they just want to just jump right in there without knowing um, everything is sort of ready to go yet. This is fabulous advice uh, because that legwork that you do at the beginning to really figure out exactly what you want to be doing now. What are your interests and skills now? Where do you think you can add the most value to an employer? That takes time and it's really hard. But if you aren't starting there and with this game plan you're talking about, you are just kind of just randomly applying for jobs and, and that, that whole idea of applying for hundreds of jobs online and hoping that something's going to come through, that really rarely works for people. So I, I, love, I love this advice and, and thank you. So before we uh, finish up, can you tell us that Baruch website or how people can um, get to it? Can you just tell us how, how to do that? The easiest way is just Google it, probably. And this is not a plug for Google, just to Google it. <laughs> uh, I would just say Google Baruch College, which is B-A-R-U-C-H, college, and then STARS, S-T-A-R-R, -R, Career Development Center. And then our website will pop up. That's the best way, because uh, otherwise the website we have, we just change it. It's not as, as easy to remember. <laughs> okay, so. that sounds great. Marian, thank you so much for joining us today. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate you inviting me to join this podcast. Well, I learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience will too. And thanks for listening to 321 I Relaunch, the podcast where we discuss return to work strategies, advice, and success stories. I'm Carol Fishman Cohen, the CEO and co founder of iRelaunch, and your host. For more information on iRelaunch conferences and events, to sign up for our job board and access our return to work tools and resources, go to iRelaunch.com. And if you like this podcast, be sure to rate it on Apple Podcasts and your favorite podcast platform, and be sure to share this podcast with a friend on Facebook, Instagram, and other social media. Thanks for joining us.